There's something that comes from our being in the presence of God. I tell you, you can get filled with the dimensions of God that that you really desperately need on the inside of you. And you may not even always know what you need and why you need it and how you need it. But all you know is that when you get into God's incredible presence, something miraculous and supernatural happens on the inside of you. He knows how to fill the void that sometimes you didn't even realize that you had. He'll touch you in a place that you didn't even realize that you were hurting. Because there's sometimes that you have lived with so much pain that you become numb to the pain. And you can hurt for so long that pain is normal to you and you don't even realize that you're in pain any longer because the pain has just been gone and the nerves have lost their sensitivity to indicate to you that you are in pain. But yet God, beside all of that, knows how to come into those deep, dark areas of your life and touch you right at the place that the pain is that, that you have blocked out. The pain that you've become insensitive to. If you let the pain of a tooth hurt for so long after a while, it'll lose its sensation to you. But there's still a problem there and he knows how to go into where there's a problem but where you've lost the pain. And that's what happens sometimes to lives that have a hard time and they go through pain and they develop this callous, this hardness over it. It doesn't stop the pain literally, but it stops you from sensing the pain. And there's still a problem inside the, the, the hardness, the callousness, underneath the callous is still a heart that has some issues. And God knows how to go in up underneath the callous and recreate the heart. The old folks used to say that he's a heart fixer and a mind regulator. Anybody remember that? He knows how to come in and touch and fix the heart. I'm just telling you that he's the one that comes to ministers to the brokenhearted. And there's some time when you believed in people and you believed in the system and it lets you down. You believe in a man, you believe in a woman and they let you down. And God has to come in and fix your heart because sometimes when you've been trusting in people and they betray you and they walk out of your life and they die prematurely on you and your heart is wounded. Have you ever had dreams to be shattered and you couldn't understand what in the world you did wrong to cause this to happen? And now you're dealing with an issue of your heart and God becomes the master of fixing that broken heart. He came, that's part of the ministry of Jesus, why he was anointed. He was anointed to minister healing, to bind up the brokenhearted. It's part of the, an explicit part of the ministry of Jesus Christ of why God anointed him. It was so that our hearts, when they become hurt, damaged, broken, that he as a master builder, touches us in that tender area and heals the brokenhearted. I'm so glad, I'm so glad, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that God is a God that heals the brokenhearted. He is. I don't know who this is for, but I just really want to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost right now. I really do. It may be somebody who's live streaming with us. I want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift to you my brothers, my sisters who may be dealing with a broken heart situation. Who are hurting so badly on the inside. Some who don't even know how to love anymore. Because they've just been hurt, they've been so disappointed and they're afraid to trust. God, heal us. Even though love is a risk and we may be hurt, God let us love anyway. God, restore the capacity 
in the hearts of your precious people to love again even when we've been betrayed even when we've been hurt even when infidelity has occurred God go into that area right now and heal begin to restore the brokenhearted of those that have experienced financial loss who put faith in a system and it failed them and they live now with fear to even trust again to invest again heal that broken heart God in the name of Jesus heal it heal it heal it God heal that person that has given everything that they could give to try to make a relationship work and then the person still walked out and left them God heal them heal heal in the name of Jesus when a mother has poured everything that she had into a child and then that child spits in her face and walks out in rebellion heal that heart God heal in the name of Jesus heal heal God heal those that have even been wounded by the church heal by people who call themselves your children and offended them God and made them walk away and not even want to have anything to do with the church, not have anything to do with religion, not have anything to do with people who call themselves Christians. And they painted with a broad brush, your people as everybody is a hypocrite. Father, I pray that you'll heal the hearts of those who have been turned off from you by some who misrepresented you. May you heal those hearts, oh God. Bring healing to them. Bring restorations to their mind, O oh God, and I pray that you'll raise up another godly example in their life to let them see the sincerity of who you really are. God, we trust you who watched your own heart broken by the death of your own son given on our behalf. And we trust you, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in every situation in which we deal that causes disturbance in us, Lord Jesus. I pray in the name of Jesus that your comfort will be experienced supernaturally, supernaturally in the hearts of your people. May the process of healing and restoration begin even now, even now, even now. We call it forth and we thank you for touching us with your grace and allowing us to know your love that makes everything all right on the inside of us, God. Thank you for that. We covenant to give you the glory and the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We bless him and honor him so much for who he is and what he means to us. Well, if you would turn in your Bibles, Acts chapter 25, we're going to cover Acts chapter 25 and 26 in this session. They sort of spill over one into the other. And you'll notice this reading, let's just pick up at the last verse actually of chapter 24, verse 27, where it says, but after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. And then chapter 25, and now when Festus had come to the province, after three days, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And then the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking a favor against him that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly and therefore he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there's any fault in him. And when they had remained among them more than 10 days, he went down to Caesarea and the next day sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought and when he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. I'm talking in this session about the boomerang effect, the boomerang effect. When Festus took office as the governor, he personally went to uh, Jerusalem here to be briefed on Paul's case. It's very interesting. And then they held a trial in Caesarea that was very, very similar to the trial that he had just had with Felix. 
before Governor Felix. And notice here at verse 7 that they made many accusations against Paul which they could not prove. They made many accusations against Paul which they could not prove. No matter who you are and where you've come from, there are going to be at some points in your life somebody's going to accuse you of something that's not true. You know why? Because people are going to misinterpret your motives. You're going to say something and then somebody's going to interpret. They're going to interpret what you said. You're going to look a certain way and somebody's going to interpret your look. I should say misinterpret it. Because people who don't know your heart will mis interpret your actions when they don't understand your heart. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Has anybody ever been misunderstood because you were doing something trying to help people and then somebody, uh, uh, you know, accuse you of having the wrong kinds of motives or uh, they accuse you of trying to be seen or they accuse you of trying to just make a name for yourself or, or whatever. They accuse you of trying to, you know, get in brownie points and that you were trying to take somebody's husband, take somebody's wife. And you get accused. Sometimes you just be nice to people and somebody, what, what you trying to do? Some people are so suspect that they, you know, if you, if you just treat people with kindness, they think that you have something up your sleeve, that you want something for, from them. You know, honey, you better, you better hold on to your pocketbook. <laughs> you know, I mean, have you heard that one before? Because people are interpreting, they are interpreting what you mean by an expression, what you mean by an action that you do, they are, they're interpreting. And so Satan, remember, one of his titles is the accuser of the brethren. He's an accuser. Satan is an accuser. So do not think it strange concerning you, the fiery trial, which is to try you, because you're going to be falsely accused. Jesus already prophetically said that, that as they, as they falsely accuse me, they're going to falsely accuse you. He said, arm yourselves, prepare yourselves for it, because they're coming after you. And uh, then notice down in, in, in verse 10 here, verse, uh, chapter 25. So Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know. Now Paul is making his own case there. He's, Paul is appealing to Caesar knowing that he would not be treated fairly in Jerusalem. Now Paul was saved, but he wasn't stupid. He knew that if he went to Jerusalem, it would be a suicide mission. So he's like, I know if, if I go back, if I go back to Jerusalem, these folks are going to try to kill me. And see, they had already secretly said, send for him, send him back to Jerusalem. We'll have some men lying in wait and we'll kill him before he even gets back. We'll take justice in our hands. We, we, we're going to kill him before he even gets there. Paul knew the kind of folks that he was dealing with. And so Paul said, I don't care what happened, I'm not going back to Jerusalem. And so Paul poured rank on them to go over Festus' head and he appealed to Caesar, Caesar Augustus. He says, let me go to Caesar. I'd rather be in, in Caesar's hand before his court. And, and then notice on down in verse uh, 18, that when the accuser stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed. Because here's what happened. Uh, Felix realizes that the issues against Paul are not civil matters for the state, but they are really religious discrepancies. He said, this, this is not a matter of, of, of the state. This is not a civil issue here. These are religious things. And see, they had religious courts. That's what the Sanhedrin court was for, was for those religious discrepancies. But then the religious court didn't have the authority to put people to death. So they had to go to civil court and try to prove something that was a more serious crime like treason or something of that nature. And so they had to falsely accuse Paul and it had no, no grounds. It had absolutely no grounds. When, when Festus listened to it, he couldn't really find any ground. When Felix listened to it, he couldn't find any grounds. And, and so they, they even uh, enlist the help of another king, King Agrippa. Notice in verse 13 that after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. And they'd been there uh, many days and Festus laid Paul's case before the king saying, there's a certain man left a prisoner by Felix. See, this thing bothered him. And he was talking about it because he said, I don't, I don't even find anything about it. But he was a, he was a political hot potato. 
and uh, they didn't know exactly how to deal with him. And so they wanted King Agrippa to weigh in on it, even though he was not going to legitimately judge him. But remember, Paul had five trials. This is Paul's fifth trial here that he's dealing with, trying to defend himself. But each time he was put on trial, every time he was put on trial, it gave him an opportunity to testify to the glory of God. You don't ever know sometimes why God lets you be accused and put on trial because somehow God's going to get some glory out of it. He'll bring attention to something that he's trying to do in the hearts of his people. When Felix here realizes that the issues against Paul are civil matters, when he realizes that, he, he realizes that he can't that they are not civil matters, rather that they are religious matters, he realizes they don't have a ground on which to condemn this man to death. Now here's what I want you to understand. That just like as with Joshua, you have to learn to be able, you have to learn what to walk around as you are facing a battle. You remember Joshua fought the battle of Jericho? You have to learn what you need to walk around. They walked around some things, didn't they? For seven days, God says, walk around it. When you're facing some battles, you need to learn to walk around some things. Don't go into everything, uh, every battle head on. There are certain things that you need to learn to walk around. Somebody's getting a word of wisdom right now. Uh, you tear too much stuff up, you get damaged too badly yourself. You have to learn to walk around certain things when you're facing a battle. The Holy Spirit will lead you around some things when you're facing battles. And so you have to be very sensitive to the Lord. Whenever there's a battle, you need to take your time and let the Lord direct you because he might want to accomplish something while you're just walking around. And have you ever been in a situation where you were under attack, whether it's your body, whether it's your mind, whether it's your relationship, whether it's your health, whether it's they are your finances, and you don't know what in the world is going on. But, but you realize I'm under attack right now. I'm, I'm in a bad place. And sometimes uh, you can come under so much pressure that one of two things will happen. You'll either want to kill yourself or you'll want to kill folks around you. But you know, you, you, you can get so stressed out that you realize somebody gonna die. And you don't always know whether it's going to be you or whether there's going to be some people around you. You know, that's how folks have sometimes, when they've gotten stressed out, they've gone postal. Because they didn't know how, what to do when they were facing a battle. God taught us through what he taught us in the life of Joshua leading the children of Israel that when you're facing a battle, that sometimes you just need to walk around and keep your mouth shut. Let the Lord hold your peace and let the Lord fight your battle and then victory shall be yours. You don't ever know what God is doing to the walls while you can't see anything happening. And one of the greatest tactics of the devil to cause us to become inconsistent in our prayer life is to make you think that while you're walking around that situation, praying, laboring in prayer, the greatest deception and delusion of the devil is to make you feel as though your prayers are not working and you've been praying and praying and the wall is still standing there and praying and praying and the wall is still staying there and you've been praying and praying and the wall hasn't moved one bit you expected that after the first day that when you really lamented and prayed and then stuff started running out of your nose that the wall was coming down you know you felt it come down on the inside but you didn't see it come down on the outside you believe you just sometimes can feel a release and you know this thing is being done in the realm of the spirit but in the natural you don't see any change anybody ever been there am I the only one who's ever been there and, and and that's why you got to know what to walk around that's why you got to know what to walk around don't start attacking stuff just because the stuff that you're trying to bring down with prayer you haven't seen it come down yet and while you're still working through things and issues and challenges don't you ever stop your praying because the devil will say look look at the circumstances nothing is changing look at your daughter look at your son Look at your money, look at your bank account. Look in the mirror, look at the doctor's report. He'll keep on talking about stuff and circumstances. He wants to talk about the circumstances and God wants to talk about the answer. He wants to talk about what he's already promised you. He, he, he will show you the picture of the victory. That, you know, you have to look at that thing and say, that is not the son that God promised me. That is not the daughter that God promised me. That is not 
the victory that God promised me. God has said to me. And you have to go back and give the devil back God's word. Even when the doctor's reports are saying this and when you are seeing symptoms in your body saying that. You, you have to say whose report shall I believe? Am I going to believe my eyes here? They're seeing swelling in my ankles here? Or am I going to believe that the healing with his stripes I am healed? You got to keep on confessing that word, walking around that situation. You got to know when to walk around and keep on praying and keep on praying. When you don't see any change in the circumstance, any change in that situation whatsoever, you got to learn how to keep on praying and don't let the accuser of the brethren stand there whispering in your ear, nah, 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 nah. nothing is happening. Look at the wall, it's still there. Just keep on walking. They don't understand about the seventh day of God. That after a while, after a while, Elijah had to pray a few times when he said that it was going to rain. And he said, I don't see anything. He said, go back again. He said, I don't see anything. He said, go back again. And after a while, after he'd come back, he said, I see a little cloud that's about the size of a man's hand. He said, you better get your chariot and start running because it's getting ready to rain buckets here in a minute. It's going to rain cats and dogs. Something is getting ready to happen. That's going to be a breakthrough in the realm of the spirit. I'm just here to tell you that sometimes things when they haven't changed, don't be moved by it. Don't go by the fact that nobody, I'm just telling you, I can go in a hospital room, you can be hooked up to tubes, I don't give a flip about the person being unconscious to me. I go in and speak to the spirit. I begin to go down to the molecular level and begin to speak life. You'll live and not die. I've gone in to folks that were in a coma and when they came out three days later, they told the family member everything that I said because I didn't go in to talk to a body. I didn't go in to deal with monitors with a thing beeping up and down and looking at drugs going into the body. I went in to deal with a body that was there that had the life of God on the inside of it, that had a promise on the inside. I went in to speak to a seed. I went in to speak to hope. I went in to speak to life that was there and to rebuke death and to say, devil, you are alive. I don't care what it looks like. I've trained myself not to be moved by what I see every now and then. You got to be able to look at a situation in your life when there's no apparent change and break out in a praise and say father I thank you that you have heard me Jesus when he said father I thank you that you have heard me Lazarus was still in the grave he lifted up his eyes and said father I thank you and then he said Lazarus come forth he knew before he saw anything that God had already done the work you got to train yourself to stop looking for the sign and look for the Savior. When you look and wonder, is there a word from God? Don't follow the signs. You better follow the word. Follow the word. Follow the word. He sent his word. And then the signs will follow the word. When you pray, when you pray, when you pray, God is mocking those prayers. I'm just here to tell you, I realize that even sometimes when mothers and fathers die and go home to glory and it looked like they died in the faith and their prayers hadn't been answered concerning their children or their grandchildren, it ain't over yet. Those prayers are still coming up as a memorial before God. And I'm just here to tell you that one day a son or a daughter, a grandson or granddaughter will be caught in the collar of their neck. And they didn't realize that God said, I heard your mama's prayer being prayed. They're still coming and I'm going to answer her. Even though she didn't see it on that side, she'll see it on this one. And they still are able to pray us in. I'm just telling you, don't you ever think that just because a wall is still up, that God's not on the throne and that he's not moving. The devil is a lie. He's an accuser trying to accuse God of being a liar. Let every man be a liar, but let God be true. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he ought to repent. Has he said it and will he not do it? Has he spoken it and will he not make it good? God will do it. He will honor his word. Touch your neighbor. Say God's going to do his word. He'll do it. God will do it. God will do it. Don't get discouraged. Get your eyes off of the symptom and just get it on the word. Get it on the word. Get it on the promise. Get it on the promise. You thank God for the promise. Thank God for the promise. Thank him for the promise. For the promise. You ought to learn how to rejoice in the promise. When a woman really sees her husband, she's not rejoicing because he's everything that he needs to be. She's rejoicing over a promise. This is a promising man. This is a promising woman. They may not be the full-blown thing of what they, but rejoice in the promise that he gave you. You know why? Because he that promised is faithful. 
He's faithful. He's faithful. He is faithful. God is faithful. I'm just here to tell you some walls are getting ready to come down. You've been praying and praying and believing and believing and giving and giving and serving and serving. And I'm just here to tell you, you can only do that so long before you have stepped into your seventh day. It was on the seventh day that God told them, walk around seven times this time. You're about to come to the end of this thing. Now we're stepping into the seventh day of God. This is the seventh day. This is the time of rest where man will cease from his labor and he will walk into the finished work of the rest of Jesus Christ. Where we, been, as, as, as we have prayed, as we have prayed that God, he, he's been letting some things, some prayers come out of your heart, out of your very soul and they're bombarding the throne and God's not forgotten one of them. He's not even forgotten any of your tears that you have shed. God bottled, the Old Testament talks about God catching your tears in a bottle. He remembers your tears are a rem memorial. I'm telling you they will water the seeds that have come out I'm just telling you that God is still a, a, a respecter of us notice here in verse 25 After they had examined him King Agrippa his Festus and all of these folks Listening to the case of Paul and they said and when when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death nothing nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus Caesar Augustus I decided to send him he said he wanted to go to Caesar I decided I was gonna send him nothing deserving of death was found in Paul nothing nothing deserving of death thank you for watching power for living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner join us again next time for power for living where revelation is power, power for living.